from Ansuman Satpathy. He's a instructor at the Department of Pathology at Stanford, and he'll be talking to you about enhancer connectomes. Uh, so thanks for the introduction, and, and thanks to the organizers for the invitation to uh, come share some of our work. So uh, my name is Ansu Satpathy. I'm a postdoc in Howard Chang's lab at, uh, and also a clinical pathologist at Stanford Hospital. So what I'll tell you about today is some uh, recent work that we've done developing new epigenomic sequencing tools uh, to study the enhancer connectome in primary uh, human cells and in particular primary immune cells. So uh, that was a great talk by Matt, and I, I think a perfect introduction and, and hopefully complementary to, to what, what I'll tell you about today. Um, so what our group is uh, interested in is also understanding how changes in the non-protein coding genome uh, impact the expression of disease-associated genes. And when, we're, when we talk about the non-coding genome, we're primarily talking about two things, cis inputs, which are typically thought of as enhancer regions that control gene expression, and then trans inputs, which are typically thought of as, as transcription factors that bind to these regions and bring them in close proximity with the genes that they regulate. And of course, I don't have to tell this audience, the reason that we care about this is because the majority, uh, the majority of genetic risk for, for many diseases, including autoimmune disease, uh, lies in this non-coding space. So for autoimmune disease, about 90% or, or 95% of the risk lies in this non-coding space, only 5% in the exome. Okay, so how do we do this? So there are essentially two challenges, right? The first challenge uh, we just heard about, which is to uh, essentially mapping the linear genome, where are the regulatory sites, right? So where are the regions that are open and active in controlling gene expression? And, and the second challenge is more of a three-dimensional challenge, which is to pair those regulatory sites uh, with the genes that they regulate, right? So these enhancers, as, you, as again you just heard, can be hundreds of kilobases or even megabases away from the genes that they regulate. So how do we uh, address those two problems? Uh, so our group has developed two methods which uh, I think address these challenges. Uh, the first is uh, a method called a TAC-seq, or assay for transposase accessible chromatin. This was developed by a former graduate student, Jason Boynrostro, in, in the group. Uh, and what Jason figured out is that if you take this naturally occurring uh, transposase enzyme, TN5, and just load it with Illumina sequencing adapters, and then just dump that enzyme onto either cells or nuclei, uh, it'll naturally integrate into these uh, open areas of chromatin and just cut and paste in these sequencing adapters. Okay? And then what you can do is PCR these regions uh, and then find with really base pair resolution, uh, similar to DNA hypersensitivity sequencing, uh, the sites that are open and active, typically promoters and enhancers in the genome. Okay? Uh, and I think for immunologists, it, it's really been a, a, a revolution because you can now do this type of assay or take these type of measurements in really low cell input samples. So 50,000 cells and now even down to single cells. Uh, and the, the one thing that TACSEQ, however, is not as good at is identifying in three-dimensional space where those regulatory sites go, right? So how do they pair with, with uh, genes in three-dimensional space and which genes do they regulate? So what I'll tell you about today is a new method that we've developed called H3K27 acetyl high chip. Uh, which now allows you to, to get these sort of 3D enhancer promoter uh, connections in primary cell types, right, down to uh, low cell inputs. And I'll just briefly walk you through this method. We can talk in the break uh, uh, about details. Uh, but essentially, this is a high c based method. So first, what we do is capture these 3D connections uh, by cross-linking and then physically linking uh, uh, regions of the genome could, that could be far apart uh, in the linear genome but close together in 3D, right? So it's a proximity ligation step. Uh, and then we perform a pull down using uh, an antibody for K27 acetyl. So this is a, a chromatin mark for active enhancers and promoters. Uh, and then we take this library of essentially uh, hybrid fragments, right? So each end of the fragment comes from two different parts of the genome, could be close together, could be far apart, uh, and then a sequence to then infer uh, what are the interactions that are happening in 3D space. Okay, so let's look at some of the primary data. So this is a high chip in K562 leukemia cells, the cell line. Uh, and we'll just focus at first on, on one gene, the MYC gene, and in particular the promoter. So what we're doing here is essentially uh, focusing the analysis and setting the anchor point as the promoter for MYC, and then just walking down the genome and asking what are the areas of the genome that interact with the MYC promoter, okay? And you can see essentially uh, we, we find five peaks here. Three of them are relatively close by, within 200 kilobases of the promoter. Uh, two of them are actually quite far away, about two megabases away, and skip over two intervening genes to touch the MYC promoter. So we want to ask, is, are we actually identifying uh, some type of functional enhancers uh, with this assay, or is this some type of noise that, that uh, often comes with these types of, uh, of genomic tools? Uh, and so what we did is compare to a number of high-resolution CRISPR screens, and I'm showing you the results from one of those comparisons. So this is a CRISPR screen done by uh, Jesse Engritz and, and Eric Lander at the Broad Institute. Uh, and what they did is essentially tile 100,000 CRISPR guides across this uh, exact same locus. 
uh, and then ask which of those CRISPR guides uh, affects MYC expression. You can see that they find uh, essentially the same five regions uh, control MYC as, as we do using HiChip. So uh, I think that with this assay, we are actually identifying some type of functional enhancer promoter connection rather than just um, 3D connections that, that, that don't uh, matter. Uh, so I'm showing you the, the results for one locus in this slide, but of course we get the same data for every gene, uh, genome-wide in a single assay. Okay, so the next question is, do we actually need to take this type of measurement in every cell type um, that we're interested in, or at least relatively similar cell types? Or could we just infer that the 3D uh, interaction uh, matrix is relatively invariant across similarly related cell types? So I'm showing you now the exact same uh, MYC locus that I just showed you, but now in two, uh, two additional cell lines. So in myla cells, which is a T cell line, uh, or uh, GM cells, which is a B cell line, you can see we get a dramatically different uh, enhancer landscapes for both those cell types, even down to the direction uh, in which the enhancers go, right? So T cell enhancers go off to the right here, um, B cells to the left. Uh, and then we can do our own CRISPR experiments to knock out each set of enhancers in, in each cell type and show that uh, if you knock out B cell enhancers, it only ex affects MYC expression in B cells and not in T cells, uh, and vice versa. Okay, so the next question is, can we actually go down to a cellular input uh, that would make it relevant for uh, uh, cell subsets, so rarer cell, cell subsets, or even potentially patient cells? And we use sort of 50,000 cells as the benchmark for that. Uh, and just to set up the challenge for you, the challenge is to improve the signal to noise of this type of assay by about uh, three orders of magnitude, right? So from 50 million cells or so to about 50,000 cells. Uh, so, and this is just, uh, what I'm showing you here is uh, our 2D interaction plots. Um, yeah, there you go, zero. Uh, and this is, so this is essentially just the raw uh, high chip data, okay? And so we're just focusing on one locus here, and I'm showing you three different experiments, starting with three cell numbers, 25 million cells, uh, 1 million cells, or 50,000 cells. And what you're looking at is just a 2D interaction plot, so you're walking down the chromosome and act, act, asking where do you see the interactions. So the large diagonal is just each piece of the chromosome with itself, uh, and anything off the diagonal is a distal interaction, in this case an enhancer promoter interaction. So you can see we get nice signal with 25 million cells, and then we can maintain that interaction uh, down to 50,000 cells. We've even been uh, able to go lower down to about 10,000 cells. Okay, so uh, having done that, we decide to go now to, to primary human immune cells. Uh, and we focused on uh, uh, some cell types that are uh, particularly relevant for autoimmune disease, which is CD4-positive uh, T-cell subsets. So we got uh, a single blood draw from three healthy donors and then purified either naive um, CD4 T-cells, T-helper 17 cells, which are sort of the inflammatory uh, CD4 T-cell, and then uh, T-regulatory cells uh, from each donor and performed high chip. Uh, and what you can see is uh, really these uh, very beautiful um, enhancer promoter interaction plots going from left to right. We're essentially zooming in on a, chromo on a chromosome. So this is chromosome 19, sort of the high up view, and then zooming in so you can see uh, these sort of uh, chromatin domains, uh, larger uh, conformation structures, and then down to the individual enhancer promoter interactions. Okay, so th the next question is, uh, again, do we need to do this type of interaction, uh, you know, build these interaction matrices for, for each cell type that we're interested in, or, or can we uh, perhaps learn some um, data from a few cell types and then um, build on those rules to essentially infer 3D interactions from 1D maps, the taxi DNA sensitivity, something uh, similar. Uh, and the answer is that we actually find a lot of complex interactions. So about 80% of the enhancer promoter contacts that we find uh, fall into a category of what we call complex interactions. So here are some categories uh, uh, of those types of interactions. So we find things like enhancer promoter skipping, which is where you have an enhancer which skips over neighboring genes and impacts uh, a distal gene. You have things like enhancer clicks, which are several enhancers working together uh, to impact a gene. You have promoter-promoter interactions. So these are promoters acting as enhancers for, uh, for other genes. Uh, and then enhancer promoter uh, switching, which is uh, uh, the example I just showed you in the MYC locus. And importantly, uh, things that we find in these T cell subsets, uh, we couldn't have found, or, or we really needed to do the assay in the cell subset that we cared about, right? So interactions that we find for Treg specific genes, uh, such as this gene LRRC32, uh, we couldn't find using sort of prior methods in either total CD4 T cells or uh, in cell lines. It was really important to do it in the cell subset that we cared about. Okay, so we'll just fast forward now to, to the question that I posed at the beginning, which is, can we use these 3D interaction maps to then uh, potentially nominate uh, target genes for intergenic SNPs associated with autoimmune disease? Okay, so I'll, I'll just focus on two uh, specific examples on the bottom, and then we'll move to more global analysis. 
So if we just focus on this uh, bottom left plot here, so what we're doing is now anchoring the analysis in our T cells uh, at this uh, SNP that's associated with type 1 diabetes and rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, it's been reproduced in several studies. Uh, and that SNP is actually closest to this gene SMIM20, uh, but you can see that uh, using these 3D interaction maps, we can actually find very nice interactions with the promoter for RBPJ uh, and STEM2, which are T cell differentiation and activation genes. Uh, similarly, for the SNP on the right, which is associated with uh, multiple sclerosis, uh, it's actually very close to the gene RMI2, but makes a, a very nice uh, high chip interactions with the promoter for SOX1 and CLEX16A, uh, which have also been shown to be involved in T cell uh, function. Okay, so now if we zoom out and do the same thing uh, genome-wide for about 21 autoimmune diseases where we have um, nice GWAS data, uh, we can actually expand the, the number of gene targets that are nominated by, uh, uh, by those SNPs by about fourfold, okay? Uh, and only about 50% of the genes that are nearest to those SNPs actually show any appreciable signal with high chip. We can even go a step further and ask using phase genomes, so these are genomes where we have the sequence of each allele, uh, and ask what's the actual effect on the enhancer promoter interaction uh, of each of those risk SNPs, okay? So compare the risk SNP to, to the non-risk. Uh, and you can see that we get uh, in, uh, changes in interactions in both directions. So you have uh, settings where the SNP actually decreases that enhancer promoter connection, and you have cases that strengthen it. So as we move forward now from just uh, thinking about how do we uh, read this type of information to now rewrite it or, or engineer it, uh, we're taking bo both approaches. And I'll just show you our, our sort of first uh, examples of going in this direction. Uh, so here I'm showing you uh, the exact same two autoimmune disease loci that I just showed you. Uh, and now uh, what we're doing is targeting uh, CRISPR, uh, uh, using CRISPR-based targeting to, to, to bring these transcriptional repression uh, domains to that enhancer, okay? So we identify that SNP, that SNP and the target gene using high chip, and now we bring, using CRISPR-I, this transcriptional repression uh, domain to that enhancer. And, and what you can see is that we can then, uh, using this uh, strategy, dial down the expression of the gene that we predict by high chip, okay? We can do the opposite using CRISPR activation, so this is now uh, bringing a VP64 domain to that locus. Um, this is in the CD69, so T cell activation gene. Uh, and so we identify four enhancers in that locus, and then now if we bring using CRISPR an activation domain to those enhancers, we can actually dial up uh, at both the RNA and protein level uh, the expression of that gene. Okay, so, so I know that was quick, so I apologize for that, but hopefully what I've been uh, able to uh, show you is that we are uh, developing new tools which are able to identify functional enhancer promoter interactions uh, genome-wide in single assay. In a single assay, and it works in, in primary cells, uh, we've done it in immune cells because we're interested in autoimmune disease, but it really should be applicable to any uh, cell type or, or disease model that you're interested in. Uh, one thing that we found is that it's really important to do it in the cell type that you care about, right? So the interactions, at least on the DNA level, the sequence level, that we find in these uh, sort of primary uh, T cell subtypes, uh, we didn't find, or, or, or it's uh, much more difficult to find uh, in cell lines, ensemble populations, or, or even mouse models. Uh, and I think as we move forward now from, from just thinking about how do we best read this information to now rewrite it, um, we're thinking about these uh, regions as sort of regulatory switches that we can then engineer for, for therapeutic purposes. So I'll stop there and I'll just thank um, all this work was done together with, uh, uh, with Howard Chang's group and Will Greenleaf and, and uh, Max Mumbach is a really a talented graduate student uh, who helped with all of it. Thank you very much.